Hello and welcome to our discussion of pricing strategies and target costing. We have two topics we're merging together here because they go hand in hand. Now when we're starting a company or expanding into a new product line, pricing is very important because if you price your product too low, you're not going to recover your cost, you're not going to generate enough profit, but if you price it too high, you may lose out on demand and you may lose out on customers and you're not going to return your profit that way either. When you're in a competitive marketplace, pricing is extremely important because, again, your competitors, if they've done their homework, they'll, they'll know how to properly price the product, and you may be too high, which means you're going to lose out on customers. You have to recover your costs. Whatever cost you truly incur, you have to recover it, and you want to generate some amount of excess for profit, depending on your desired profit levels. Now, we have to consider when we're going to see the cost we're talking about, we have to consider short-run costs versus the long-run costs. So if we're talking about introducing a new product line altogether, we can't just look at one individual year. We have to look at the expected life of the product and any costs we're going to incur over that life. They're called life cycle costs, and we'll see that a little bit later. Again, we have to include full costs. So in managerial accounting, we tend to focus heavily on direct materials and direct labor because every additional product we produce is going to take additional direct materials and additional direct labor. Really, it's going to take any of the variable costs. Whereas the fixed costs, the a lot of times the indirect costs, those were uh, they don't relate to one individual product. They're going to be there no matter how many products we produce within our relevant range. But what we're basically saying here is we have to include the full costs to make sure we're successful. We can't ignore any of those costs. Now, we have two main pricing strategies. There are others, but these are the two we're going to talk about. Cost plus pricing and market-based pricing. You could also have hybrids of the two, but we're going to spend our time today talking about just these two types. First with cost plus pricing. This is, as the name implies, you take a look at your cost, plus you add in a particular markup to get your price. Now, this can be used when you are a price setter. In other words, you have the power in that industry to set a price, and your customers will still be willing to pay it, within reason. But it's not, it's not like you're taking a price. You're not a price taker where you just have to take whatever the market bears. Now, this would work well in a less competitive market where there's not a whole lot of competition to even set a price. So if, if people want your particular product, they're going to have to pay the price you ask. It may also work when you have substantial product differentiation, which basically means that your product is better or does something that another product doesn't. So even though the industry may be similar, you're the only one that does this. Market-based pricing, on the other hand, is used when you're in a competitive market. You have to take the price that the market gives you. You don't have the ability to set prices on your own. I mean, you can, but if you don't match the price of everybody else, you're going to lose out on a lot of customers. In this situation, this is where we're talking about the target costing. You're going to take whatever price they give you if you want to keep the customers. So that's the price. You subtract out your cost, and that gives you profit. So whatever profit's left. So the best way to do it is actually flip that around a little bit. You take the price. There's nothing you can do about the price. Subtract out the desired profit you want for that amount of investment. And then you back into what's known as a target cost. And you have to get down to that cost to hit the profit that you want. So let's take a look at cost plus pricing in more detail. We want to determine the full cost of the product with direct and indirect costs. And again, this includes life cycle cost allocations. We'll talk about that term a little bit more later. But basically, it's any research and development would be a great example of starting cost. If you have that research and development in year one, you, the reason you invested was that now you have a product that's going to last, I don't know, five years. So it might make sense for managerial accounting to try to amortize that cost out over five years spread the cost out over five years. We can't do that for financial accounting on our financial statements under U.S. GAAP, 
but we certainly can do it for our internal managerial accounting reports. And that makes a that gives you a better idea of kind of what your true profit is for each year of the product. Now you have the cost, determine the desired markup percentage. So what is your target rate of return? Consider what you may have just a hurdle rate internally, a company or a departmental hurdle rate, but also consider what could you earn if you just invested that money in some other investment altogether. CDs, stocks, bonds, a bank account, what return would you get there? You want to at least earn that rate of return with this investment here. So you take your cost and you add in one plus the desired percentage. And I, when I say, one, I, I'm saying that one plus the desired percentage, you have to multiply that percentage by the cost. You're adding in that markup. So cost plus your markup is going to be the desired selling price. So here we have a better example that'll that'll maybe make that clearer. If you've determined that your full product cost is $775 and your desired markup rate is 14%, then you're going to have the $775 plus $108.50 profit. That's the 14% markup. So when you add those two together, you're coming up to $883.50. That's your desired selling price. Now let's switch gears and talk about the market-based pricing again in more detail, the target costing. You need to identify the price that you believe you, you can get the market to respond to and again a lot of times this will be considering what the competition is selling your price for selling that product for what uh, has the historical price been how has demand changed when those prices change and we'll talk about that in just another couple lines here we need to consider any value-added features in our product that nobody else has should we charge a premium for them or not and what I was saying in the first bullet point was really, it's called price elasticity of demand. What that basically tells you is, if you change your price, how will demand change? Now this is not an economics class, so we don't talk about the supply curve and the demand curve and how price uh, falls within those, the intersection of those. But we do need to have a pretty decent idea of price elasticity. You don't need to know the term necessarily, but what it means is if you increase your price, are you going to force demand down quickly? If you increase your price by 10%, is demand going to drop by 10%? Or is demand going to probably stick at the same amount and they'll tolerate a little bit of a price increase before it starts to fall? That's what tells you how elastic the demand is. If it's what's considered an elastic product, then if, if you increase your price just a little bit, you're going to see a much larger decrease in demand. Kind of think about a rubber band. It's elastic. If you pull on it and then snap it back, the snapback tends to be, uh, has has a more of a response than the original pull in many cases. Just the way it's, if it's, if it's really elastic, it will. Just like a ball, when you bounce a ball, that's elastic, anything like that. In elastic products, you can change the price for a little bit and not see much of a decrease in demand. But these are things that are requirements. These are things that people pretty much have to pay for. There are no suppliers, no alternatives out there. So they have to take on the price. Now, at some point, that'll change. Uh, if, they, if you raise the price, you triple the price, you're probably going to see some change in demand. Unless it's an absolute required product, that everybody has to have. Think of some medicine that only one pharmaceutical has anything close to it, and if you have that particular illness, then that medicine is extremely important, and that's an unfortunate situation. We've seen that happen with uh, pharmaceuticals a little bit the past couple of years, different pharmaceutical companies trying to do that exact same thing. So it's, it's not a good thing to take advantage of, but this is just talking about the price itself. So here, if we were using target pricing, target costing, I'm sorry, we would take the allowable market price, subtract out the desired profit, and that'll tell us what our target cost is that we have to hit. 
For example, if we have if we deem the allowable market price to be nine hundred dollars, that's what the market will bear. We want a desired return of ten percent on that price. Then that means our desired profit is going to be ninety dollars. Ten percent times the nine hundred. So to get our target cost, we take that nine hundred dollar price, subtract out ninety dollars of profit, and our target cost is now down to eight hundred and ten dollars. That's where we have to fall for this to work out. Now again, if we're using this method, once we determine that target cost, we have to hit it, and we have to do whatever we need to do, redesign the product, find cheaper suppliers of materials or labor to hit that target cost, redesign things. This drives cost reduction because it's a goal that we pretty much have to hit or else we're going to reduce our profit below the desired level. So we talk about a couple of things here called value-added analysis. Do all the th activities that we're performing really add value to this product? Do they support the price? Is the customer willing to pay for these bells and whistles, so to speak? And then value chain analysis, we take a look at every part of our value chain, like our suppliers, our distributors, all the different links, and we see if there are any additional links that we maybe aren't adding value we don't need necessarily. Now, life cycle costs, this is what I was talking about earlier, so we already have a pretty decent idea of it, but research and development and design costs, these occur in the early years, really before a product is even released. So these costs occur, but they had to occur before we can get into production and all of that. So we can't just ignore them. They're important costs, and we want to make sure to price our product to ensure we recover these costs. Otherwise, what's the point? But then we have the, the other costs that come throughout the production itself. We have the production costs, marketing costs, distribution, customer service. These are all going to occur continuously throughout the life of this product. So these are the ones that are obvious, but we can't forget about these early life cycle costs. And the goal is to spread them out over the expected life of the product so that we properly price our product to cover all these costs. So this takes us to the end of our discussion on pricing strategies and target costing. Hopefully this has helped to clarify a few of these concepts and topics. Thank you for your time, and I will talk to you in our later sessions.